Hello, and welcome to Lecture 5 of Advanced Topics in Quantum Information Theory. In this lecture, we're going to discuss a few additional concepts concerning generalized entropy measures. In particular, we will discuss the min relative entropy, the conditional max entropy, and the hypothesis testing relative entropy. And we'll relate these measures to the ones we discussed previously, particularly the max relative entropy, the conditional min entropy, and the ordinary quantum relative entropy. This will be the last lecture devoted to generalized entropy measures. There is still much more that could be said about these notions, and they are still being very actively studied. But it's an appropriate time in the course to turn our attention to other topics. We'll begin with the quantum min relative entropy, or just the min relative entropy for short, which is defined as you see here on the screen. The min relative entropy of rho with respect to q is simply the negative logarithm of the squared fidelity between rho and q. Naturally, I assume you're familiar with the definition of the fidelity function, which has already come up many times in the course, but it's always a good idea to remind others which definition of the fidelity you're using. Sometimes authors take the definition of the fidelity to be the square of the definition here, but I don't include the square in the definition. So we have to square the fidelity in the definition of the min relative entropy. In the case that the fidelity between rho and q is zero, by the way, we make the natural interpretation that negative log of zero is equal to positive infinity. There's also a smooth version of the min relative entropy, which is defined in a completely analogous way to the smooth max relative entropy that you see written here. Once again, the smoothing can be done with respect to whatever notion of epsilon closeness you wish to consider. We won't discuss the smooth version of min relative entropy further, but it does exist and there are interesting things that can be said about it. We'll make two brief observations concerning the min relative entropy. First, an analog of Klein's inequality holds for it, meaning that if rho and sigma are density operators, then the min relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma must be non-negative, and zero if and only if rho equals sigma. That's quite immediate from the fact that the fidelity between two states is always a number between zero and one, and is one if and only if the states are equal. Second, the min relative entropy is monotonic with respect to the action of channels, meaning that the now familiar looking inequality written here is true. Again, that follows from the fact that the fidelity function is non-decreasing under the action of all channels, and indeed for all positive and trace-preserving maps. We could at this point list additional properties of the min relative entropy. The fidelity function possesses many interesting properties, and those properties translate directly to properties of the min relative entropy. But there really isn't a point in doing this, we'll just use our knowledge of the fidelity function as we analyze the min relative entropy. Next, we'll prove a basic fact concerning the min relative entropy, which is that it is always upper bounded by the ordinary quantum relative entropy. And here, that fact is stated as a theorem. Let's see how the theorem is proved. First, notice that there is nothing to prove in the case that the image of rho is not contained in the image of q, because the right-hand side of the inequality is positive infinity in this case. So we'll focus on the case that the image of rho is contained in the image of q. In this case, Nothing is lost if we assume that q is positive definite. This is because the values of both the min relative entropy and the ordinary relative entropy of rho with respect to q don't change if we restrict our attention to the image of q and imagine our operators are operators acting on this space. Next, let us define a function phi from the open interval negative one to one to the real numbers as phi of alpha equals negative one times the natural logarithm of the trace of rho to the one minus alpha times q to the alpha. We're using the natural logarithm because we'll use some basic calculus in the proof, and the calculations will be a little bit simpler with natural logarithms. By the way, it should be clarified that it's not really important that this function is defined on the entire open interval from negative one to one. We're really only gonna care about the closed interval from zero to one half, but we do need the function to be differentiable at zero. It is the case though that phi is differentiable everywhere on its domain with its first derivative given by this formula. That's not difficult to show and you can do it using ordinary vanilla flavored calculus. Just start with spectral decompositions of rho and q, expand everything out, take the derivative with respect to the variable alpha and then simplify to get the formula written here. <laughs> 
Notice in particular that the derivative at zero is just the ordinary quantum relative entropy of rho with respect to q, or at least that's what it would be if it weren't for the fact that we use the natural logarithm rather than the log base 2. And that's where the factor of 1 over the log base 2 of e, the base of the natural logarithm, is coming from. By evaluating the function phi at the value 1 half, we obtain the negative natural logarithm of the trace of the square root of rho times the square root of q, which is at least 1 over 2 times the log base 2 of e times the min relative entropy of rho with respect to q. The 2 in the denominator, by the way, comes from the fact that it's the fidelity squared that appears in the definition of the min relative entropy, whereas the square is absent in the definition of phi. It's also the case that phi of 0 is the negative natural logarithm of 1, which is 0. Thus, we see that the theorem will follow from a demonstration that the derivative of phi evaluated at 0 is at least 5 1 half minus 5 0 divided by 1 half. And that fact will follow from the fact that phi is a concave function, so that the tangent line at alpha equals 0 lies above the graph of the function itself, which implies the inequality. To prove that phi is concave is conceptually very simple. We just need to compute the second derivative and observe that it is non-positive. I won't go through the details, except to suggest one way to do it that avoids the calculation becoming too messy. We start with spectral decomposition of rho and q as I suggested before, and then we define a function r sub a b as you see written here. Here a and b are indexing the eigenvalues of rho and q, and we might as well restrict our attention to the positive eigenvalues of rho and q. You can check that if we fix alpha and allow a and b to range over these sets of indices, we will obtain a probability distribution for every possible choice of alpha. Using these functions, it is possible to express the first derivative of phi as is written here, and if we go through the process of differentiating again, we will obtain the expression written here after some simplifications. And at this point, we find that this function is always non-positive by Jensen's inequality. And that completes the proof of the theorem. Next, we'll briefly discuss the conditional max entropy, which is defined in terms of the min relative entropy in an analogous way to the way that the conditional min entropy is defined in terms of the max relative entropy, as is written here. Unwrapping the definition of the min relative entropy reveals this simple expression written here. By the fact that the min relative entropy is upper bounded by the ordinary quantum relative entropy, we obtain immediately that the conditional max entropy is at least as large as the ordinary conditional quantum entropy. If we also include the inequality that the conditional min entropy is upper bounded by the conditional quantum entropy, then we have these relations, which are perhaps consistent with what you might expect from measures bearing these names. It can be challenging to keep all the mins and maxes straight, but the names do make sense at the end of the day. Let's take a look at a few classes of states. In the case of product states, there is no correlation at all between x and y, and the conditional max entropy of x given y is just a function of the state of x. It's twice the log of the trace of the square root of the state of x. Naturally, we can drop y from the notation in this case and call this quantity the max entropy of x. We have to be a little bit careful here though, because unlike the min entropy, this is generally not consistent with the way people would interpret the term max entropy. Often max entropy is defined as the logarithm of the rank of the state, or the logarithm of the support size in the case of a probability vector, and that's different from what we have here. For classical quantum states, we have this formula for the conditional max entropy. There's nothing shocking here, that's just the formula we get. For a third and final example, we may consider perfectly distillable states, meaning the following. Let tau be the canonical maximally entangled state on two copies of the register x, and suppose that rho is a state of the pair x, y, for which the state tau can be perfectly obtained by applying some channel locally to y. States like this have to have the very special form that's written here, but that's not really important for the sake of the example. Anyway, just like the conditional min entropy and conditional quantum entropy, 
The conditional max entropy of any state like this is negative log of n, where n is the dimension of x. The last thing that we'll discuss concerning the conditional max entropy is its very interesting relationship to the conditional min entropy. We'll state this relationship in the form of a theorem, as we have here. What it says is that if we have three registers, x, y, and z, that are in a pure state, then the conditional min entropy of x given y is always exactly negative 1 times the conditional max entropy of x given z. The same formula is true if we replace both of the conditional entropies with the ordinary conditional quantum entropy, simply because the entropy of the pair x, y must equal the entropy of z, and similarly the entropy of x and z must equal the entropy of y, given the assumption that the state of the three registers is pure. This one, however, where we have the min and the max is not quite so immediate, but it isn't too hard to prove. We'll go through a proof in just a moment, but before doing this, let's recall a fact concerning the fidelity function. Specifically, Let's suppose that we have some positive semi-definite operator q0 acting on the space x, as well as an extension p0 of q0. What that means here is that p0 is a positive semi-definite operator acting on x tensor y, such that if we trace out y, we're left with q0. Suppose moreover that we have a second positive semi-definite operator q1 acting on x. What the fact says is that if you maximize the fidelity between p0 and p1, ranging over all p1 that are extensions of q1, then you'll get exactly the fidelity between q0 and q1. It's not hard to prove this fact, you can do it by combining Ullman's theorem with the fact that the fidelity is non-decreasing under partial tracing. It is a convenient fact though, particularly because the extension p0 of q0 can be chosen arbitrarily and we will in fact see how this is useful in the proof that we're about to cover. Finally, just as a reminder, recall from lecture 2 that the conditional min entropy of x given y for the state rho can be expressed as you see here. We're going to make use of this expression for the conditional min entropy in the proof. Now, on to the proof. First, we'll prove that the conditional min entropy of x given y plus the conditional max entropy of x given z is non-negative, which is equivalent to the inequality that you see written here. To be clear, we are assuming that the state of the triple x, y, z is a pure state, and we'll take that state to be represented by a unit vector u. Using the characterization of the conditional min entropy that we just recalled, let rho be the state of x, y obtained by tracing out z and let phi be any channel that achieves the maximum in that characterization. So in other words, it has to satisfy the equation that's written here. We'll now use the fact concerning the fidelity function that we observed a moment ago. We know that if we apply the channel phi just to the system y for the pure state u, then we obtain an extension of the state obtained by applying phi to the y part of rho, simply because u is a purification of rho. Maximizing the fidelity over all extensions of the operator vec identity vec identity star must yield the original fidelity. That's what we get from the fact about the fidelity. The operator vec identity vec identity star, however, has rank equal to 1. So any extension of this operator has to be simply this operator tensored with some density operator, which here we're naming sigma. There's just no other way to pick a positive semi-definite operator that yields vec identity vec identity star after partial tracing over z. Another way of thinking about this is that you cannot be correlated with a system when it is in a pure state. Finally, given that the fidelity is non-decreasing under partial tracing, we see that if we perform the partial trace over the second tensor factor of x for both arguments, then the fidelity cannot decrease, and so we obtain the inequality that's shown here. The right-hand side is at most 2 to the conditional max entropy of x given z, as that's the value obtained by maximizing over all states sigma. So we obtain the inequality that we need. That's half of the proof, and for the second half, which proves the reverse inequality, we'll use exactly the same fact concerning the fidelity function, although with different choices of the operators. This time, choose a density operator sigma that maximizes the fidelity in the definition of the conditional max entropy for the state obtained by tracing out y, as is written here. 
we're going to choose this purification of the operator, identity on x tensored with sigma. Really, this is just a canonical purification, where we take the vectorization of the square root of the operator that we're trying to purify. Now, when we apply the same fact concerning the fidelity as before, we need to understand every possible extension of the original state of x and z, which we obtain by tracing out y from the pure state u. There is a theorem that characterizes all of the possible extensions you can have for such a state, and you might recall that theorem from the Theory of Quantum Information course if you took it. It's simply all of the states that can be obtained by applying some channel to the part of the pure state that was traced out. This theorem, in turn, is a fairly simple consequence of the unitary equivalence of purifications. What we obtain is that the equality written here must be true for some choice of a channel xi. And once again, by the fact that the fidelity function is non-decreasing under partial tracing, we can trace out both tensor factors of z to obtain the inequality written here where phi is the channel obtained by first applying psi and then tracing out z. Using the characterization of the conditional min entropy once again, we obtain the required inequality and the proof is complete. The last topic for this lecture and for this portion of the course on generalized entropy measures is the hypothesis testing relative entropy. Here's the definition. As usual, we're given a state rho and a positive semidefinite operator q, along with a real number epsilon in the closed interval from 0 to 1. We define the epsilon hypothesis testing relative entropy of rho with respect to q as negative 1 times the infimum of the logarithm of the inner product between q and x, taken over all positive semidefinite operators x that satisfy two conditions. First is that the inner product of rho with x must be at least 1. And second, epsilon times x must be less than or equal to the identity operator with respect to the positive semidefinite ordering. We'll try to make sense out of that definition in just a moment, but first let us observe a couple of things about it. First, notice that as epsilon decreases, the constraint that epsilon times x is less than or equal to the identity becomes more and more relaxed, meaning that more choices of x will satisfy the constraint. That means the infimum goes down or remains the same so that the negative infimum gets larger. In short, decreasing epsilon means that the epsilon hypothesis testing relative entropy gets larger, so you have a stronger and more sensitive notion of divergence for smaller and smaller values of epsilon. That's good in the sense that the smooth max relative entropy has the same quality. Decreasing epsilon means less freedom to smooth, resulting in a larger value. And indeed, when epsilon equals zero, we get exactly the same quantity for both measures, which is simply the max relative entropy. It is possible to have infinite values for the hypothesis testing relative entropy. The list shown here tells you when the value is infinity. We never actually made a list like that for the smooth max relative entropy, but you could come up with such a list. Basically, if you have a large enough epsilon to smooth rho to a state whose image is contained in the image of Q, then you'll get a finite value for the smooth max relative entropy and otherwise the value will be infinite. We are, I should say, generally more interested in the situation where the image of rho is contained in the image of q. Very briefly, before continuing on, let's take a moment to consider the extreme cases epsilon equals zero and epsilon equals one. As we already noted, the zero hypothesis testing relative entropy is simply the max relative entropy. At the other extreme, when epsilon equals 1, the constraint that epsilon times x is less than or equal to the identity becomes x is less than or equal to the identity. And in this case, we might as well take x to be the projection onto the image of rho. That's because we need the inner product with rho to be equal to 1, and rho has trace 1. We obtain the expression that you see here. This quantity has been called the min relative entropy by some, but obviously we won't use that name, given that we've already used it for something else. We don't really need a name for it though. If we need to refer to it, we'll just call it the one hypothesis testing relative entropy. Next, let's observe that there is a semi-definite programming characterization of the hypothesis testing relative entropy, specifically the epsilon hypothesis testing relative entropy of rho with respect to q is the negative logarithm of the optimal value of the semi-definite program shown here. 
The primal problem comes directly from the definition of the hypothesis testing relative entropy, and computing the dual problem results in what is shown here. Both problems are strictly feasible when epsilon is in the open interval from 0 to 1, so strong duality holds by Slater's theorem. We also have strong duality in the extreme cases epsilon equals 0 and epsilon equals 1. In those cases, we have strict feasibility in one of the two problems and feasibility in the other. Now let's talk about the interpretation of the hypothesis testing relative entropy, and for the purposes of doing this, let us focus on the situation that Q is a density operator, which we'll call sigma to help us to remember that it's a density operator. Assuming that epsilon is non-zero, we can express the epsilon hypothesis testing relative entropy as is written here. You can think of P in this expression as being x divided by epsilon, for x and epsilon as in the definition. The operator P is a measurement operator, and we can think of it as one of two measurement operators of a measurement that aims to distinguish between the states rho and sigma. If we think of sigma as representing the null hypothesis and rho as representing an alternative hypothesis, then P is to be interpreted as the measurement operator that signals the alternative hypothesis, or equivalently, as a rejection of the null hypothesis. We don't necessarily require P to signal the alternative hypothesis with high probability, but it does signal the alternative hypothesis with probability at least epsilon. So you can think of epsilon as representing the weakness that you're willing to tolerate from such a test. The negative exponential of the hypothesis testing relative entropy of rho with respect to sigma is then the smallest possible value that can be achieved for an optimally chosen P. The probability given by the inner product of P with sigma is the probability of a false positive, or in other words, a type 1 error. So you can think about epsilon hypothesis testing relative entropy as being a measure of how surprising it would be to obtain a false positive from such a test. You might be wondering why the scaling is selected the way it is, or in other words, why we have epsilon in the denominator in the objective function. The reason for that is that this is the scaling that gives us an analog of Klein's inequality, at least when epsilon is less than 1. I should mention, and it will probably not surprise you at all to hear it, but there isn't universal agreement on the definition of the hypothesis testing relative entropy. Some authors choose a different definition, and what is particularly confusing is that sometimes the definition will effectively reverse the meaning of epsilon, so that a larger epsilon gives a stronger notion of divergence. That seems backwards to me, but it doesn't really matter. Everyone is free to pick their own definitions, as long as they're clear about what those definitions are. The hypothesis testing relative entropy is monotonic under the action of channels, or more generally, under the action of all trace-preserving and positive maps. An easy way to see that is to look at the dual problem. If we have any feasible solution to that problem, then we immediately get a solution to the dual problem for the hypothesis testing relative entropy of phi of rho with respect to phi of q by simply applying phi to y. Lambda stays the same. We obtain exactly the same objective value for this new solution because phi preserves trace. And that means that the optimal value can only get bigger for the problem corresponding to phi of rho and phi of q. And that gives us the inequality that we require. The last thing we'll do in the lecture is to relate the hypothesis testing relative entropy to the smoothed max relative entropy. They aren't the same thing, of course, but they do have a pretty close relationship. In order to do this, it will be helpful to recall the Connick program for the smoothed max relative entropy from lecture 3, shown here for convenience. We'll actually prove two theorems. One establishes an upper bound on the smooth max relative entropy in terms of the hypothesis testing relative entropy, and the second theorem does the reverse. The bounds don't really have the same form, so that's why we're taking them as separate theorems. Here's a statement of the first theorem. We're restricting our attention to the case that the image of rho is contained in the image of q, as well as to the case that epsilon is contained in the open interval between 0 and 1. And you can see here the inequality that the theorem states. We'll go through the proof, but I won't put too much emphasis on the details. It's more important to focus on the basic idea, and you can check the details by looking at the course notes more carefully if you choose to do that. 
Anyway, we'll start with a dual problem for the smoothed max relative entropy, and suppose that z is optimal for that problem. What we're going to do is we're going to use the spectral decomposition of z to try to show that the hypothesis testing relative entropy is large. And the way that we'll do that is to pick out a subset of the eigenvectors of z, take pi to be the projection onto the space spanned by those eigenvectors, and then take x to be pi divided by epsilon. And by taking this x in the primal problem for the negative exponential of the hypothesis testing relative entropy, we'll obtain something small, thereby showing that the hypothesis testing relative entropy is large. Now the specific way that we choose the eigenvectors onto which we'll project depends on the inner product of the rank 1 projection corresponding to each eigenvector, with the operator rho minus 2 to the lambda times q for different choices of lambda. Specifically, for a given choice of lambda, we'll include each eigenvector in the projection pi when the inner product I just mentioned is strictly positive. The idea here is that we want to take lambda to be as large as possible in order to give us a small value for the semi-definite program on the right-hand side of the screen, because then the inner product of x with rho will be large and the inner product of x with q will be small. However, we need to make sure that we obtain a feasible operator when we do this. So let's look at the largest possible value of lambda that we can choose. Here the supremum of those values is named gamma. Now there is a technicality here, which is that taking x to be equal to pi sub gamma divided by epsilon might not be feasible. But if we pull back just a little bit by any positive delta, then we will get a feasible operator. And now if we go through a short analysis, we get an upper bound on the objective value we obtain for the semi-definite program. Using the fact that delta could have been chosen to be arbitrarily small, and then taking the negative logarithm, we obtain this lower bound on the hypothesis testing relative entropy. It's still in terms of gamma, but we'll leave it alone for now. Next, we need to say a little bit more about the smooth max relative entropy, and the way we can do that is reminiscent of some of the calculations that we performed in lecture four. Specifically, using the same collection of projections that we just talked about, we can think about what happens when we smooth row by projecting onto the space orthogonal to those projections. And by using Winter's gentle measurement lemma, we can conclude that smoothing in this particular way keeps us inside of the square root of epsilon ball around rho with respect to trace distance. And after a few lines of analysis, we get an upper bound on the smooth max relative entropy in terms of the same value gamma that was defined previously. We now put together the two bounds and we obtain the bound that we're trying to prove. Obviously, some of the steps in that analysis were deserving of greater focus than I gave them, but the bottom line is that we've used an optimal dual solution to our conic program for the smooth max relative entropy to obtain a pretty good solution to the primal problem for the hypothesis testing relative entropy semi-definite program, and that suffices to prove the theorem. The second theorem establishes an inequality that goes in the reverse direction. This time, we get an upper bound on the hypothesis testing relative entropy in terms of the smooth max relative entropy. The idea of the proof is very similar, though. This time, we start with an optimal solution to the primal problem for the smooth max relative entropy. Or, in other words, we start with a smooth state psi satisfying the inequality that's written here. This time, we'll try to come up with a decent solution to the dual form of the semi-definite program for the hypothesis testing relative entropy. This one is going to be simpler. Given that psi is epsilon close to rho with respect to trace distance, we know that there has to be a positive semi-definite operator r having trace at most epsilon, for which rho is less than or equal to psi plus r. And now we can simply take the choices for lambda and y written here and plug them into the semi-definite program. It's almost immediate that this is a feasible solution, and it is easy to calculate the objective value. Taking logarithms and negating proves the theorem. And one final remark to conclude the lecture. 
Notice that the bounds established by these two theorems, combined with the main result from lecture 4, implies the corollary you see written here. That is, by regularizing the hypothesis testing relative entropy, we obtain the ordinary quantum relative entropy. That's because we can upper bound and lower bound the hypothesis testing relative entropy in terms of the smooth max relative entropy. We do end up with additive error terms, but they disappear when we divide by n and take the limit. Of course, we also need to check the epsilons and the deltas, but this can be done for both bounds while remaining inside of the open interval from 0 to 1, and the theorem from lecture 4 takes care of the rest. That's all for this lecture. As always, feel free to ask questions if you have them.